This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles, Exodus chapter 14 and uh, verse 10 through 16, reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture, there you'll find these words. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. And they cried out to the Lord and, and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It is better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Escape through the Red Sea. And then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. I want to talk today simply from the subject, handle the challenge, handle the challenge, handle the challenge. It would be wonderful if life were just uh, like a fairy tale that you get married and lived happily ever after. But what they don't tell you is in between getting married and living happily ever after, there are challenges that you deal with. Uh, it's not that when you get saved that it's the end of trouble. Sometimes it's the beginning of trouble. And you can't run from trouble. If you're going to do anything worth doing, there are going to be challenges associated with it. If you, that the moment that a woman gets pregnant and she's going to be a mother and the, and the dad is going to be a father, that the moment that that experience happens, there are going to be challenges with being a parent. There are going to be challenges with being a child. There are challenges in this world. Jesus told us in this world, you will have tribulation. You're going to deal with tests, temptations, trials. You're going to experience trouble in this world. My admonition to you is handle the challenge. Handle it. Handle it. Just handle it. Uh, you can't be excused from it. Because let me tell you this, if you are spending your life giving people excuses as to why you're not handling the challenge, do you know people don't want to hear your excuses? I mean, just talk to your friends and just give them excuses every day about why you can't perform. They'll get tired of you really quick because nobody wants to hear anybody's excuses. Just handle the challenge. There's sometimes people that come to me with different issues, and I, I've, I've looked at some people in the face and just, just had to slap them. I mean, figuratively speaking. Uh, just by telling them this deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it, who else is going to deal with it? You can't just put your head in the sand as though it's all going to blow over and, and everything will be all right in the morning. No, no, no. Deal with it. Deal, deal with it. So, uh, there are challenges that we're going to have. And God told the children of Israel, listen, I'm going to take you out of, out of bondage. I'm going to get you out of here. I got a promised land prepared for you. But the, the issue is that in front of every promised land, there is always a problem. There's always an obstacle in front of every dream. There is something that is, uh, there is an adversity in front of every vision. Every desire of your heart, every 
aspiration. There's going to be something that's going to challenge you. But there is generally a problem in front of every promise. Freedom is the promise. The promised land is the promise. But there's always a problem in front of every promise. Promises are easy to profess, but challenging to possess. It's just the way that it works. It's so easy to profess it, but it's challenging to possess it. There's going to be a challenge. There's going to be a challenge. So don't expect a sudden breakthrough of the promises uh, without your having to do some things. Don't expect a sudden breakthrough to happen in your life this year without your obedience. Don't expect a certain sudden breakthrough in your life this year without your discipline. Don't expect a sudden breakthrough in your life this year without your consistency. Uh, there are certain things that you have to have. You have to have obedience. You have to have discipline. You have to have consistency if you want a breakthrough. You see, a breakthrough is preceded by a buildup. It is a buildup of your obedience of doing what God told you to do, of being disciplined to resist the temptations to go a different direction and being consistent in your ways. This is why the Bible says men ought always to pray and not to faint. And this is not speaking to, to, to the male gender. Mankind should always pray and not faint or give up. There has to be a consistency, a diligence, a discipline. If you're not disciplined, then you will quit the moment that you have trouble. Have you ever been on a job and people begin to challenge you and then you something on the inside of you says, you know what, they don't pay me enough to deal with this. <laughs> have, you, have you ever worked, uh, you know, it, it, anybody work in customer service and you, and you know, you deal with the public and folks are coming in and calling in and, and all of this and, and you sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll say to yourself, they don't pay me enough to deal with this. See, there's always a temptation to quit. And that's why you have to resist that urge. So there has to be obedience. There has to be discipline. There has to be consistency. You're not going to just all of a sudden just have your vision just because you said it. You're going to deal with challenges. I mean, yeah, everybody wants the honey in life. But in order to get to the honey, you got to deal with the bees. And that's going to be... You got to risk being stung. And let me just tell you, you're going to get stung sometimes. And, and you can't just start whining and crying and just sitting there. I don't want to do this no more, God, because I'm going to try to get the honey. And somebody, and somebody, somebody stung me. And they start talking about me. Handle the challenge. Handle the challenge. Handle the challenge. I'm telling you, I'm going to have honey on my finger even if my hand is swollen. <laughs> I'll deal with it. I will deal with it. Now, it may be a little different thing if I'm allergic to bees and if it's going to close up my windpipe. I'm going to use somebody else's hand. I'm going to get me a long mitten. I'm going to find a way. Handle the challenge. Handle the challenge. Handle the challenge. Tell somebody next to you, handle the challenge. Let me just say this to you. Every person who becomes great does so because he or she addresses a problem. Every person who becomes great in life does so because they handle a problem. They find a problem and solve a problem. Moses became great because he handled the problem of slavery. Whenever you find a problem, if you're going to become great, it's because you address a real problem that was plaguing people. In the, in the health industry, I mean, if you're a doctor, if you solve problems, whether it was a, a Charles Drew that developed blood plasma, if you solve a problem, if you handle a problem, you're going to be esteemed great because you addressed a problem. Nobody is ever considered great who didn't solve a problem. You've got to address a problem. So if you want greatness in your life, you've got to deal with problems. David did not become great until he dealt with the problem of a giant called Goliath. So God uses problems to expose greatness. You don't become great. Nothing becomes great until it overcomes opposition. Nothing becomes great until it overcomes opposition. Nothing becomes great. Now here are at least five ways that God uses problems in your life. And just five ways at least. 
that God uses problems in your life. Now, I know most people say, you know, a problem ain't no blessing. I ain't praying for no problem. I'm praying for an answer. Well, you don't get answers unless you have problems. Here's the first one. God uses problems to direct you. God uses problems to direct you. Problems can actually point you in a new direction. Problems can point you in a new direction. They can point you in a new direction. You know, I was in China and I accessed my Facebook account. They shut my account down. I had nearly 700,000 followers there and they shut my account. I, can't, I still can't access it. And, and, uh, but now, because I had that problem, I opened up an account on LinkedIn. I posted a picture there, me and my wife. I just checked yesterday. I had 1.3 million views. I never would have gone to LinkedIn had Facebook not shut me down. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes God can use problems to die, direct you. He'll close one door so that you find another path to be able to get there. There are, there's always another way. Touch somebody said, there's always another way. There's always another way. There's always another way. I don't know who needs to hear this, but there is always another way. There is always another way. There's always another way. There's always another way. So is God trying to get your attention for you to change some of your ways? There's always another way. Maybe he uses a problem to direct you. When, you, when you've been stupid long enough, you know, God will send a problem your way. I mean, problems become an antidote to stupidity. They have a, a, a harsh way of becoming ammonia when you are completely oblivious to issues in life. They will, they will sober you. Problems will sober you. You get real serious, you get, you get problems. You get a health problem uh, uh, serious enough. You get a money problem serious enough. Problems have a way of sobering you and directing you to the proper things. Here's the second thing. God uses problems to inspect you. To, to expose what's on the inside of you because you don't know who people are until they have a problem. There are some people that are so nice and sweet until you challenge them, until you said, oh, oh, no, 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 you can't do that here. You don't know who people are until you tell them no. And then, oh, oh, then now you, then here comes Dr. Jekyll. He, he's, he's coming out because you told him no. You don't even know who people, as long as you're agreeing and giving people everything that they want, Problems inspect you. They, they, it's, uh, problems become like a, a, a tea bag. You don't know what you got until you get in hot water. But it is the hot water that exposes what's inside of the tea bag. You don't know what's inside of the tea bag until you get it in hot water. Then it flavors the water. And so sometimes God will use problems in your life to show you your insecurities. God will use problems to show you areas of where you have been prejudiced against this or that or the other thing. God will use problems to inspect you. He uses problems to direct you. God uses problems to inspect you. Thirdly, God uses problems to correct you. Because there are some lessons that are only learned through pain and failure. And so children, sometimes they have to touch something hot in order to learn, don't touch that. And they've got to be burned sometimes. It's just to correct them. It's just to correct them. It's not to harm them. It's just to correct them. You let a child get burned by something. And you tell them, baby, don't touch this. Don't touch this, baby. And then the child will, out of their curiosity, they just want to touch it. And then once they get burned, when they come near it again, they, hot, hot, mama. <laughs> mama, hot. They'll tell you. But they won't tell you that until they've first been burned. So sometimes God uses problems to correct you. God uses problems to direct you. He uses problems to inspect you. He uses problems to correct you. Uh, fourthly, God uses problems to protect you. To protect you. A problem can be a blessing in disguise if it prevents you from being harmed by something that is much more serious. That, that was one man that, uh, that I talked to that worked in the World Trade Center on 9-11. And he overslept that morning. And then when he jumped up and ran out to his car, his car wouldn't start. He had a problem with his car. And, and, and it prevented him from being there in the building when the airplanes hit. His life was saved because of a problem. Because God can use a problem to protect you. He can use a problem to protect you. He can use a problem 
to protect you. And it can stop you from going into dangerous situations. So you don't ever know what, what God is doing. Sometimes you can have an issue in your home and you can't get ready on time. You can't find, you got a problem finding your keys, finding your glasses, finding your shoes. And it could delay you from being at an intersection where somebody was trying to get to work on time and has run through the light and it could be preventing a crash. So sometimes God will give you a problem because that problem is actually protecting you. See, God is God and God knows things about your life. He knows about the circumstances that you can't even see, but he can see somebody. And God can create a problem to say, I need to delay this person to prevent an accident in their life. So sometimes problems can be used to actually protect you. Protect you. And then fifthly, God uses problems to perfect you. Because problems, when responded to correctly, are great character builders. Problems can help us to learn to be patient. And patience develops strength of character on the inside of us. So God can use the problems in your life to actually perfect you. Some, sometimes the people that have gone through some of the worst problems have some of the best character. I mean, look at Nelson Mandela sitting in jail for 27 years. And you would have thought that when he got out that he would have had vitriol hatred for everybody. And he was so loving and forgiving toward people. It, it, was, it was amazing. He, he counted it a blessing. God uses problems. Even uh, uh, David wrote about it in Psalm uh, 4 and verse 1. He says, hear me, O God, uh, when I call. He says, O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. God, that's when you grew me, when I was under pressure. You, you, I was having problems in my life. He says, that's when you stretched me. That's when you grew me. That's when you expanded me. It's when I was having challenges because you don't grow in an atmosphere of comfort. The comfort zone is a place of mediocrity. And so if you're going to grow, you have to always be an outside of your comfort zone. You can either choose to be comfortable or you can choose to grow. But growth and comfort do not coexist. It, when a child's foot is growing and, and, uh, and you just bought them shoes three months ago and they told my mama these shoes too, too tight. And that's why, you know, the mamas back in the day, when you went to get shoes, there was so much room in that shoe <laughs> that it literally felt like a flip flop because they... They wanted to give you room to grow into it because I'm not going to be buying you another pair of shoes in three months. So they'd leave some space at the end of the shoe so you wouldn't be telling them that. It's amazing. But David says, you enlarged me. You grew me. You stretched me. You, you enlarged my capacity when I was under stress, impression, dealing with problems in my life. Because your problems help you to grow up. Your problems help you to grow up. And that's why one of the worst things that you can do to your children is to solve all of their problems for them. That's how you create spoiled brats. Because you solve all of their problems. If they don't learn to solve problems while they are with you, why in the world would you think that they can solve them once they get out of your house? Give them some problems and then ask them, what, how, what do you think about this? How, how do you think you're going to deal with this? And let's see how you, let's see some ideas that you can get to earn some money to be able to do this. Because you see, it doesn't work that whenever you get a problem in life that you just said, you know, oh, you know what? I, I need another $2,500. Uh, hey, hey, pops, can you uh, cash out me? <laughs> no, no, no. You want them to learn how to handle the challenge. And if they don't learn how to handle the challenge while they are with you, don't expect them to be able to handle it well when they are without you. So this is why you have to have problems because it helps us to grow up. I'm really inclined to agree with the words of Dewey Smith that said that we only think when we are confronted with a problem. Isn't that interesting? Just think about that. He said we only think when we are confronted with a problem. I mean, if you don't have a problem, there's no reason to think. But the moment you have a problem, you have to start thinking through the process. Problems challenge you to think. That's why people hate problems. Because they challenge you to think. 
They challenge you to think. That's the thing that I, I have such great disdain for in social media because everybody loves the pleasure and the convenience of an opinion without the pain of thought. Because nobody wants to think. But a problem challenges you to think. If you have a problem in your relationship, you're going to have to think, I need to do something differently. If you got a problem in school, you're going to have to think through that. If you got a problem on your job, a problem in your neighborhood, a problem with your health, you are going to have to think through this. God uses problems to grow us up, to mature us, and to develop our thinking capacity. The people that are the greatest thinkers are the ones that have dealt with challenges instead of running from them. And so they realize that there are problems in my life and I need to deal with this. I'm going to handle the challenge. Just tell somebody next to you, handle the challenge. I love something that uh, Alan supporter said that is profound and yet so true that the best way to escape from a problem is to solve it. The best way to escape from a problem is to solve it. You want to get out of it? Solve it. So not run from it. Not try to pray it away. Solve it. Solve it. Solve it. Solve it. Uh, I, I love the brilliance of Albert Einstein who said that the problems that exist in the world today cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. So God uses problems to stretch you and to develop your life because once you have gone through a problem and solve that problem, it leaves you at a higher level of knowledge, a higher level of authority, and a higher level of responsibility because you cannot solve a problem with the same level of thinking that, that created it. The problem will challenge you to grow. It'll challenge you to grow. And here's one thing. Never assume that you're too old to handle a challenge. Never assume that you're too old to handle a challenge. I mean, just refuse to die. Refuse to die just because you got a problem. I mean, death is an escape. But don't, 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 don't assume that you're too old to handle a challenge. Do you realize that the Bible says in Psalm 92 that they that be planted in the house of the Lord shall still bring forth fruit in old age? And, and, and I don't know whether this is prophetic, but it says they shall be fat. And flourishing. Now you know that doesn't mean he's not talking about obese. Now he's. It's a sign of prosperity. It's a sign of you know. Of course you know the older you get, the harder it is to keep it off, isn't it? Can I tell you some individuals that I am so glad that because they got older, that they didn't let challenges intimidate them. That's why I said, don't ever get too old and think that you know what. That's that's for the young folk. That's for the young folk now. Young is a state of mind. So don't leave all of the innovation to young people. The millennials and Generation Z, they, they don't own innovation and disruption. They, they don't own it. Because you see, every older person was a young person. And they used to think new ideas. And you can still think New ideas. Are you aware that Benjamin Franklin didn't invent bifocals until he was 78 years old? 78 years old. Winston Churchill was 78 years old when he wrote a book that won his first Nobel Prize for literature. He was 78. Nelson Mandela was 75 when he was inaugurated as the president of South Africa for the first time after spending 27 years in prison. He was 75. Grandma Moses, who was an exceptional artist, didn't sell her first piece of artwork until she was 90 years old. She sold her first piece at 90. What a great start. What a great start. What a great security to her retirement. Michelangelo didn't begin the awesome work on St. Peter's Basilica until he was 72 years old. He didn't begin until he was 72. Until he was 72 years old. You know, just September of 2019, an Indian woman by the name of Mangayama Yaramati gave birth 
at 74 years old to twins. And she and her old husband were just tickle pink. <laughs> 74 years old. Can you imagine that? Trying to breastfeed twins, getting up. Mama, 78 years old, going to elementary school, trying to get her child registered for kindergarten. <laughs> but she's tickle pink. She just had these babies last September. The oldest mother in the world, oldest mother in the world. A Japanese man, 80 years old in 2013. Yuchiro Miura became the oldest man at 80 to climb Mount Everest. 80 years old and he climbed Mount Everest. Some of y'all scared to go to Stone Mountain. Don't ever let somebody else think, make you think that you're too old to accept a new challenge. In 2007, a woman by the name of Nola Ox, O-C-H-S, she became the oldest woman in the world to graduate with a bachelor's degree. She was 95 years old. And after she graduated at 95 with her bachelor's, she still kept on taking classes until she was 100. She just died, you know, just uh, 2016 at 105. It's amazing. But she, that's what I call being a lifelong learner. A lifelong learner. She got her bachelor's at 95 and kept on taking classes until she was 100 years old. A lifelong learner. And just recently, a few years back, a 92-year-old woman became a first-time home buyer. Because she applied for a special program and qualified for a 30-year loan. <laughs> 92. First time home buyer. 92. Go grandma, go grandma. <laughs> I love it. First time home buyer. Got a low interest rate too. <laughs> and I want to encourage you with this that whenever you are faced with a challenge you have options just know that whenever you are faced with a challenge you have options you always have options you always have options say that with me you always have options it's the truth. You always have options. And so my, my advice to you is explore them. Explore them. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you always have options. You always have options. You always have options. And so when we talk about handle the challenge, when facing a challenge, the first thing that you must fix is your perspective. You've got to fix your perspective. You cannot fix your problem until you fix your perspective about the problem. You cannot fix your problem until you fix your perspective about the problem. I'd take a screenshot of that if I were you. But you honestly cannot fix your problem until you fix your perspective about your problem. Because problems are not permanent, they are temporary. No problem lasts forever. No problem lasts forever. Because, you know, by definition, a problem is that which can be solved. It is that which can be solved. And if it cannot be solved, it's not a problem. It's a fact of life. So you don't worry about it. You know, uh, that I'm a black man in America, that's not a problem. That's a fact of life. That's a fact of life. So it, don't, don't make a fact of life a problem for you. And, and I want you to think of some of your challenges or problems. I want you to think of some of your challenges or problems. Just, just think with me for just a moment of some of your challenges or problems. People will say, I don't have enough money. Yeah, uh, I don't have enough uh, education. I don't have enough experience. Somebody else, well, I don't know enough people. Somebody else, 
I'm not strong enough. I'm not good enough. Now, now listen, I want to give you a shift in perspective. Just a shift in perspective. Because the, the problem is not the problem, it's your perspective about the problem. I want to show you in just a moment. Put, that, put the screen back up just a moment. Because I want to show you, just put, put the screen back up that we've just shown, the, the list there. Now, I want to show you how to just shift your perspective here for just a moment. You see that I don't have enough money yet. I don't have enough education yet. I don't have enough experience yet. I don't know enough people yet. I'm not strong enough yet. Just a three letter word can pivot your whole perspective. Are you seeing what I'm saying? It is saying that I've got faith that I can do this if you just give me time. If you just give me time. If you just give me time. You know, for the longest, I, I, I just because I'm, I'm an academician, I just felt that I wasn't good with my hands and couldn't put things together. That, that was not the case. The issue was I didn't want to take the time to read the instructions that lay all of the stuff out. It's so tedious and I mean, I know some people are just naturally gifted. Some people can just put stuff together without the instruction. But I realized that if I took my time, if I took my time, if you give it time, you'll be surprised. You can develop. Nobody becomes a virtuoso without giving it time. Nobody becomes a doctor without giving it time. Nobody becomes a professor without giving it time. Time. Nobody is able to bellow out in a glorious falsetto without giving it time. You got to have practice over time in order to make you a master of whatever it is that you do. So don't say that I can't do it. I can't do it yet. When you say yet, yet says that I have the faith that if I'm faithful, if I'm consistent, if I am diligent, if I'm obedient to practice, practice, practice. Over time, I am going to get there. Does that make sense to you? I hope you see that you can shift a perspective by just saying, I don't have the money yet. I can't afford that trip yet. I don't know this person yet. I'm not marriage material yet. But if you work on something, if you start working today, that one little three-letter word yet can shift your perspective to where you can do it. That's all it takes is a three-letter word to shift your perspective. And what if the things that you thought that were holding you back were actually your superpower? Can you imagine young David? Disadvantaged, he's a teenager fighting a skilled warrior, Goliath. He's fighting a big man. Can you imagine how that kid felt? This man has a sword and a shield and armor. David has no armor. But he's got a slingshot. He's got an advantage. David doesn't have a reputation to live up to. That's the advantage of the underdog. That's why you can have a little, a, a little upstart coming and fighting the person who's the champion. Because the champion is already on top. They don't have as much fight in them. Because they're not as hungry because they've already gotten there. But the one who's coming out the ghetto and he need the money and Big Mama need the money and Junebug need the money and Peanut need the money. Your whole family is and you don't have anything to lose because you don't have anything but you got everything to gain. Can you imagine the tenacity? That's what I call an underdog advantage. Because here he was a little boy compared to this giant that was nine feet tall. About nine, nine, two. The size of Goliath. And he could have been intimidated in his perspective saying this man is too big to defeat. But instead David took the attitude and said this man is too big to miss. And I just want you to see, I want you to just, just see that if you shift your mindset, if you shift your mindset, because uh, David, David is a, is a little boy. Uh, Goliath operates with a sword. That means that he's used to real up-close combat. But David operates with a sling. When you're little and they're big, you need distance. He's got an advantage because you don't throw a sling right up on the dude. You need distance. Because if they ever get their hands on you, 
they just grab you and beat you to death. They can cut your head off. David knew with his disadvantage that that's my superpower. Because I got to get a weapon that matches my handicap. And he says, you're big over there. And I got this thing that I, I, I can win from a distance. But you got to win up close and personal. I got to be within arm's reach of you for you to cut my head off with your sword. You will never kill me unless I'm within range of you. I got to be within four or five feet of you. But David could from 50 yards away. He was masterful. He knew how to work that slingshot. And he put, he had, he had five rocks. One for Goliath. And Goliath had four other brothers. And he says, if I need to knock their brothers out. That's what I call being prepared as a teenager. He realized, I got to have some extra shots in case I need backup. And so he had that. It gave him advantage. And sometimes what you might think is a weakness can be an advantage if you use your head. When you got a problem, that problem will force you to think. That problem will force you to think. Tell somebody, handle the challenge. I just want to tell you that the giant in front of you is never bigger than the God within you. The giant in front of you is never bigger than the God that is within you. The giant in front of you is never bigger than the God that is within you. You know, while the ten... Ten of those twelve spies that visited Canaan had the wrong perspective. Joshua and Caleb had the right perspective about possessing the promised land. Gideon had a, a wrong perspective about conquering the Midianites. So God had to convince him through miracles. But here's what I want you to see. That when you're faced with a challenge, here's the first thing that you can do. Is that you can fight. When you're faced with a challenge, fight. 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 Use your strength to resist. Use your strength to conquer the challenge. Use your strength. Use your wisdom. Use your strategy. Fight. When you are faced with a challenge, fight. When you fight something, it means that you have to face it. Because you will never conquer what you are unwilling to confront. And when you face it, God can help you fix it. When you face it, God can help you to fix it. So, I want to say this to you though. Don't, don't fight while you're angry. Because when you're angry, you can't think and you cannot focus. The, the person that loses the match is the one that loses the temper. Listen, the one who loses the fight is the one who loses his, his or her temper. They're the one that loses the temper. It, it breaks your focus and it breaks your thinking capacity. Whenever you find people that get really anger, anger is really always based on fear. Anger is based on fear. It's based on fear. Fear of what? Fear of losing what you've got. Fear of losing the status quo. Fear of being embarrassed. Fear of being exposed. Fear of being rejected. Whenever you see an angry mob, they don't like the fact that you're going to change. You're upsetting the status quo. That's why there's an anger. They're angry because of something that you're changing. There is a fear of losing something. Of coming into another. So whenever you find a person that's angry, you have to say, what is this person really afraid of? Anger is a sign of, 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 of fear. Of fear. If a husband gets angry. He's afraid that his authority is being undermined, that he's being disrespected. He's afraid of something. He's afraid. He's afraid. There's a, it always exposes fear. Anger exposes a certain fear. It's amazing that I want to just tell you, don't, don't just fight for the sake of fighting. Don't just fight for the sake of fighting. Because, but when you're faced with a challenge, fight, fight. But don't just fight for the sake of fighting. Fight out of purpose. Fight out of purpose because you got a purpose. Don't just fight because you're mad. Fight out of purpose. Fight out of clarity. 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 I know what I'm fighting about. Don't just be fighting just because somebody else is fighting because you see dudes fighting and it, 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 mob violence and somebody else is throwing a chair and a bottle and you, you join in and you don't even know what the issue is about. Fight out of clarity. Fight out of your godly convictions. A godly conviction. Don't just fight to fight. Fight out of a godly conviction. Fight for what you love. Fight for your family. Fight for your destiny. Fight for your friends. Fight for your future. Fight for your faith. Fight for your freedom. Fight for your health. Fight for your prosperity. Do you realize that when you're trying to do something, you got to fight for it? You got to fight to, to, to stay well. If you, if you got a sickness, you got to fight to try to live. It's a fight. You got to fight with everything you've got. You got to fight with your diet. You got to fight with exercise. You got to fight with, with rest. 
You got to fight with scripture. You got to fight with prayer. You got to fight with your doctors. You got to fight with everything that you've got. And when you're challenged with poverty, you got to find ways out of that poverty. You have to. And here are some ways out of the challenge of poverty. But when you're dealing with poverty, you got to fight with everything you've got. Don't succumb to it. Fight with everything you've got. Here are some ways out of poverty. Anybody interested in knowing? Number one is pain, pain, pain. We change when we hurt enough that we have to change. When you get to the degree that uh, when the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than your pain of changing, then you'll change. Pain motivates some people who are poor to get out of that is because it hurts long enough and it hurts too much that now they are motivated to do something about it. When you hurt enough that you have to change, you'll change. Pain forces us to change. Some people come out of their poverty because the pain of it was so intense. Secondly, other folks that get out of poverty is through a specific talent. They got a talent. It could be athletics, and that's their ticket out. It could be music, and that's their ticket out. It could be acting, that's their ticket out. It could be comedy, that's their ticket out. You got to find some special talent. Find the uniqueness of whatever God has put in you, and you can get out. You can get out. You can get out. Look for a specific talent. There are some people that got a specific talent, and it helps them to get out. The third way is that somebody sponsors you. It's through sponsorship. Sponsorship. Somebody who takes interest in you. Somebody that sees potential in you and they decide to mentor you. You got to find a sponsor. A sponsor that can help you to show, uh, uh, the, the, show you the ropes out of there. They can mentor you and help you to understand the mentality that is not the same mentality under which you've grown that you're trying to leave. You got to find people that don't have your problem but find folks that's got your answer. And that's why you have to have folks that sponsor you. Somebody takes interest in you. My pediatrician growing up, uh, he said to me one day, he said, you know, I, was, I grew up in poverty, but he says, a woman paid for my education for me to go to med school. She sponsored him. She sponsored him, a black doctor, a little black boy uh, from, the, from the country. And, and, and a woman, the woman that, that wrote the book, Going with the Wind sponsored his med school education sponsored him out of that sponsored him and, and not only was he my pediatrician he became the pediatrician for my children of course I see what's going to him when I was a grown man <laughs> I went to college you know I'm the, I'm the oldest one in the pediatrician's office <laughs> and here's the fourth thing helps you get out of the challenge of poverty is a goal or vision to be better there are some folks that have a goal. They get a vision. They just catch a vision from somewhere in their poverty to be able to get out. you got to see something in order to be something. Somebody inspires you. Something in, it, it inspires you because exposure changes you. And you start asking questions. Start asking questions. You know why? Because problems are closed rooms. Problems are closed rooms. But questions are doors. They give you access that open that room. A problem is a closed room, but a question is a door that allows you to be able to get out or get in, whatever it is that you're trying to do. It's amazing what God can do if you just let God be God in your life. If you just let God, don't let the problems of where you are hold you back. Don't let those problems hold you back. You're designed to handle the challenge. And I, I promise you this. Just when you thought that you had it really hard, somebody else has a challenge that's worse than you. I want you to take a look at this video from my friend. Take a look. And it's not oxymoronic for me to say third grade and dropout. That third grade dropout, the wisest person I ever met in my life who taught me to combine knowledge and wisdom to make an impact was my father. A simple cook, wisest man I ever met in my life. Just a simple cook, left school in the third grade to help out on the family farm, but just because he left school doesn't mean his ed education stopped. Mark Twain once said, I've never allowed my schooling to get in the way of my education. My father taught himself how to read, taught himself how to write, decided in the midst of Jim Crowism, as America was breathing the last gasp of the Civil War, my father decided he was gonna stand and be a man. Not a black man, not a brown man, not a white man, but a man. 
He literally challenged himself to be the best that he could all the days of his life. I have four degrees. My brother is a judge. We're not the smartest ones in our family. It's a third grade dropout daddy. A, a third grade dropout daddy who was quoting Michelangelo, saying to us, boys, I won't have a problem if you aim high and miss, but I'm gonna have a real issue if you aim low and hit. A, a country mother quoting Henry Ford, saying if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. I learned that from a third grade drop. Simple lessons, lessons like these. Son, you'd rather be an hour early than a minute late. We never knew what time it was in my house because the clocks were always ahead. My mother said for nearly 30 years, my father left the house at 3.45 in the morning. One day she asked him, why daddy? He said, maybe one of my boys will catch me in the act of excellence. I want to share two things with you. Aristotle said, you are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence ought to be a habit, not an act. Don't ever forget that. I know you're tough, but always remember to be kind. Always. Don't ever forget that. Never embarrass mama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If daddy ain't happy, don't nobody care. But you know, I tell you. Next lesson. Lesson from a cook over there in the galley. Son, make sure your servant's towel is bigger than your ego. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Y'all might have a relative in mind you want to send that to. Let me say it again. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Pride is the burden of a foolish person. John Wooden coached basketball at UCLA for a living, but his calling was to impact people. And with all those national championships, guess what he was found doing in the middle of the week? Going into the cupboard, grabbing a broom, and sweeping his own gym floor. You want to make an impact? Find your broom. Every day of your life, you find your broom. You grow your influence that way. That way you're attracting people so that you can impact them. Final lesson, son, if you're gonna do a job, do it right. I've always been told how average I can be. Always been criticized about being average, but I wanna tell you something. I stand here before you, before all of these people, not listening to those words, but telling myself every single day to shoot for the stars, to be the best that I can be. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better, and better isn't good enough if it can be best. Let me close with a very personal story that I think will bring all this into focus. Wisdom will come to you in the unlikeliest of sources, a lot of times through failure. When you hit rock bottom, remember this, while you're struggling, rock bottom can also be a great foundation on which to build and on which to grow. I'm not worried that you'll be successful. I'm worried that you won't fail from time to time. The person that gets up off the canvas and keeps growing, that's the person that will continue to grow their influence. Back in the 70s, to help me make this point, let me introduce you to someone. I met the finest woman I'd ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. Back in my day, we'd have called her a brick house. <laughs> this woman was the finest woman I'd ever seen in my life. There's just one little problem. Back then, ladies didn't like big old linemen. The blind side hadn't come out yet. <laughs> they, they like quarterbacks and running backs. We're at this dance, and I find out her name is Trina Williams from Lompoc, California. And, and we were all dancing, and we're, we're just, just excited. And I decide in the middle of dancing with her that I would ask her for her phone number. She, Trina was the first one. Trina was the only woman in college who gave me her real telephone number. <laughs> The next day we'd walk to Basket and Robin's ice cream parlor. My friends couldn't believe it. This has been 40 years ago and my friends still can't believe it. We go on a second date and a third date and a fourth date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we drive from Chico to Vallejo so that she could meet my parents. My father meets her, my daddy, my hero, he meets her pulls me to the side and says, is she psycho? But anyway, <laughs> we go together for a year, two years, three years, four years. By now, Trina's a senior in college. I'm still a freshman, but I'm working some things out. <laughs> I'm so glad I graduated in four terms. Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan. 
So now it's, it's, it's time to propose. So I talked to her girlfriends and it's California, it's in the 70s, so it has to be outside. You have to have a candle and you have to have, you know, some chocolate. And listen, I'm from the hood. I had a bottle of Boone's Farm wine. That's what I had. <laughs> she said yes. That was the key. I married the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life. Y'all ever been to a wedding and even before the wedding starts, you hear this. How in the world? <laughs> and it was coming from my side of the family. <laughs> we get married, we have a few children. Our lives are great. One day, Trina finds a lump in her left breast. Breast cancer. Six years after that diagnosis, me and my two little boys walked up to mommy's casket. And for two years, my heart didn't beat. If it wasn't for my faith in God, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. If it wasn't for those two little boys, there would have been no reason for which to go on. I was completely lost. That was rock bottom. You know what sustained me? The wisdom of a third grade dropout. The wisdom of a simple cook. We're at the casket. I'd never seen my dad cry. But this time I saw my dad cry. That was his daughter. Trina was his daughter, not his daughter-in-law. And I'm right behind my father about to see her for the last time on this earth. And my father shared three words with me that changed my life right there at the casket. It would be the last lesson he would ever teach me. He said, son, just stand. You keep standing. You keep standing, no matter how rough the sea, you keep standing. And I'm not talking about just water. You keep standing. No matter what you don't give up. Sometimes life will throw you a curveball. It'll give you tragedies and sadness and death and sickness that you didn't see coming. And sometimes the only way for you to be able to get up the next day is to fight. Sometimes you got to fight to get out the bed. Have you ever been in that place where you said, God, I, I don't understand why this is happening. But Jesus, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you to help me. God, I can't do this. I can't go another day. I say to you, just as Dr. Rick Risby's father told him, just stand. Son, just stand. Daughter, just stand. Sometimes you got to fight your way just to be able to stand. And after you've done all that you can do, stand anyhow. Don't give up. You don't have permission to quit. God doesn't accept resignations. You can only stand. Stand through it. Stand through it. God will see you through. God will see you through. God will see you through. Whatever challenge that you're dealing with, whether it's a health challenge, a financial challenge, a relationship challenge, a skill ch challenge in your own life, an addiction challenge, if you don't give up, and if you'll stand and hold God's hand and look up toward him, I'm just telling you, you'll be just like Moses was when God said, Moses, quit talking to me and move the people forward. It's time for you to move forward. Handle the challenge. Handle the challenge. You don't get a pass out of this. You've got to just handle the challenge. And I don't know about you, but even when we've gone this far on the journey we've come to that place where I feel in my own heart that Lord I don't feel no ways tired I've come too far from where I started from we hope that you enjoyed that message don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos and if you want to partner with us click the give now button Thank you for what you do.